Good evening and welcome to the third symposium of the State of Our Constitution series called the North Carolina Constitution Education. It's the final part of a three-part series which explores the history, the enforcement, interpretation, and importance of the North Carolina State Constitution. It is being made into a documentary for the North Carolina, Carolina Journal TV, which can be viewed at cjtv.carolinajournal.com. Hello, and my name is Bill Graham, and I will serve tonight as your moderator for this wonderful panel. We're coming to you uh, tonight from the campus of Catawba College in Salisbury, North Carolina. And the state of our Constitution has been in many historic places across North Carolina. The first symposium was held in Chowan County uh, at the courthouse in Edenton. The second symposium was held at the Capitol Building in Raleigh. It's an honor to be here again at Catawba College in the Piedmont, a region that has its rich history and political and entrepreneurial history. Many of the folks in North Carolina are familiar with uh, Food Town, or Food Line as it's known today, and finds its home here in Salisbury, as well as the soft drink Cheerwine finds its home and founding in Salisbury as well. It should also be noted on a more historical basis that uh, our former president, Andrew Jackson, practiced law here in Salisbury in Rowan County. And uh, a rebellion of sorts uh, turned, uh, came about in the 1760s and 1770s, uh, which is apropos to today's discussion, at least part of it, which rebelled against unfair taxes and fees, and uh, it became known as the Regulator Rebellion. Uh, tonight, we have many sponsors that we want to introduce to you tonight, and uh, this program would not be possible without it. And we wish to especially thank Gene Boyce, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Carter, the Honorable Rusty Duke, Fair Annexation Coalition, the Duplin Winery, Ruthie Harrell, Mark McNeely, Michael Munger, George Stevens, Stop NC Annexation, the Honorable John M. Tyson, North Carolina Property Rights Coalition, and finally the William Mullen Foundation. Now let me go and uh, uh, introduce our, our panel, and I will start uh, to my immediate left. Uh, uh, this is uh, John, Professor John Dynan from Wake Forest University. He's Professor of Political Science and author of uh, The American State Constitutional Tradition. Welcome. Um, Next we have uh, Mr. Terry Stoops. Uh, Terry is Education and Policy Analyst at the John Locke Foundation. Welcome, Terry. And finally, uh, at the end of the table, uh, at your far right, uh, is uh, former State Supreme Court Justice Bob Order and former co-gubernatorial campaign with me. Welcome, Bob. And Bob also serves as currently as Director of North Carolina Institution, uh, Institute for Constitutional Law. Now, um, before we begin our discussion concerning the history and enforcement of uh, judicial interpretation of the state constitution, I think it's best for us to start uh, with what the constitution says and so we can define the framework of our discussion. Now, let me talk, start with uh, Terry Stoops. Terry, uh, what does the North Carolina constitution say about education and in particular uh, please comment on the uh, right to privilege clause that we find in the North Carolina Constitution. Under the Declaration of Rights in Article 1, Section 15, the Constitution says that the people have a right to the privilege of education and it is the duty of the state to guard and maintain that right. And under Article 9, Sections 1 through 10, there are nine components that are brought out. Education is a political and social good. Education should be a uniform system. There are guidelines for attendance. There's governance issues, especially related to the State Board of Education. There's funding, state and county and local school funds and sheets, and higher education. In fact, in 1776, they created the University of North Carolina, which was a fledgling institution until basketball was created in 1891. <laughs> Justice Orr. Now, North Carolina, uh, of late particularly, judges have played quite a role in uh, education. And what does the state constitution say, or it doesn't say, regarding the role of judges in education in North Carolina? 
Well, first let me say how delighted I am to be here in Salisbury and with my friend Bill, whom I got to spend a lot of time with uh, back in 07 and 08. Uh, if you read the Constitution, you, you don't see the term judge in the education uh, article, Article 9, uh, and it's certainly not referenced in the Declaration of Rights. But uh, judges have and continue to play uh, a critical role in the interpretation of the Constitution and certainly rights that are, that are set out in the Constitution. In fact, it was in the case of Baird v. Singleton uh, back in the late 1700s that the articulation of, of the right of the judiciary to strike down unconstitutional acts of the General Assembly uh, was articulated. And, and we like to point out this was well before the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Marbury versus Madison. Uh, even today we see judges uh, on our appellate courts interpreting these constitutional rights of education. We'll, we'll talk at length about the Leandro decision. And we certainly see trial judges, uh, particularly the trial judge assigned to the Leandro case, which is uh, now been going on I think about nine years um, or longer, uh, having a very important role in, uh, in how these constitutional rights uh, to education play out. Professor Dinan, uh, this discussion about judges and involvement uh, with North Carolina education, how does uh, our Constitution and or our involvement with judges in education differ from other states? Sure. Well, North Carolina's constitutional provision on education are fairly typical of the state constitutions around the country. And in one particular respect I want to call attention to, and that is the reasons that are given for why you set up a school system. In a clause that was added in 1868, and I'll read it, the North Carolina Constitution states, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools, libraries, and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. Many of you might recognize the first part of that, which is taken verbatim from the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. It's significant that of the three reasons given for why we set up schools, religion, morality, and only then knowledge. In short, it's a reminder that the founding generation had a broad purpose of the understanding of education, not only for its intellectual benefits, but for its contribution to religion and morality. Anybody else want to follow up or comment before we go on to the next issue? All right. Well, now that we've sort of laid out a slight framework of the discussion, uh, I want to go in and, and discuss a little bit more um, in detail and then we've had two previous state constitutions, one in 1776 and one in 1880s, uh, sorry, 1868. And these were drafted in times in which terminology may be slightly different than we currently use. I wanted to ask uh, Terry Stoops, what did the early constitutional framers mean by public education? And why was the language right to privilege added during the 1868 constitution? Well, it's important to note that when individuals in the 19th century talked about public education, they weren't talking about the type of system we have now. The state-controlled, state-funded system uh, that uh, essentially monopolizes uh, education in, in any given state or community. They talked about a school system, a public school system, public schools that had public functions. And this meant that uh, local communities controlled them, they usually uh, funded them. So the, public, the idea of public education in the 19th century was much different than it is uh, today. Now an interesting story about this right to the privilege clause, which was inserted, uh, inserted by a man named S.S. Ashley at the Constitutional Convention of 1868. Now Ashley was a minister from Massachusetts who came down to the South after the Civil War as a, as a carpetbagger and uh, essentially wrote this section. Now it's very difficult to determine exactly what this right to the privilege clause means because where Ashley was getting it from was from a lot of these abolitionist journals uh, that he had been reading. In one sense it's referring to a right, uh, a right such as the right to vote. 
in another sense, it's used as a privilege, and in Ashley's term, a privilege such as communion or baptism. So we see a, a, a large difference in the way that this right to the privilege clause is used, and certainly its origins are very unconventional. It's not a legal term as much as it is a religious or a social term. Professor Dinan, we're operating under the Constitution that uh, finds its uh, uh, foundation in basically since 1971, current public education system. How is that different today than the 1868 version of the Constitution? Sure. I would call attention to two changes that took place between 1868 and 1971. One is a greater realization of the importance of education in contributing to everybody's lives. And let me illustrate this. The 1868 Constitution said that schools must be provided at least four months of the year. Come 1918, they said schools must be provided at least six months every year. By 1971, we get the current language, schools must be operated at least nine months in a year. So that's one change that's taken place. A second development it's a very important one, and that is a realization that education must be provided equally for all, regardless of race. The original 1868 language said nothing about school segregation. That was not added until 1876 when the Constitution required that individuals be educated at different schools based on their race. Obviously, by the time that we got to drafting the 1971 Constitution, intervening U.S. Supreme Court decisions had made clear that segregated schools were now a thing of the past. So the drafters of the 1971 Constitution obviously eliminated that requirement for school segregation. And then they took the extra step of cementing that goal by saying that equal opportunities shall be provided for all students, making clear that the era of school segregation was now past. We've talked about uh, judicial role before, and I wanted to delve into that topic a little bit more in detail, but in speaking about court cases, as I mentioned before, judges in North Carolina have had a particularly active role in determining the issues that involve public education in Tar Heel State. So I was wondering how the courts interpret or have interpreted the state constitution, and uh, let, me, let me go to Judge Orr here uh, particularly, and let's start with you. So uh, sort of asking myself here, um, how have the courts interpreted the state constitution, but particularly uh, how have they interpreted the role of the superintendent of public instruction in the Adkinson case, named after our superintendent of public instruction, and the recent charter school funding cases? It's a lot, a lot of questions to try and cover in a short period of time. You're, you're used to, you're used to <laughs> that's it. Right. Well, let me start with the charter funding and work backwards. The, that's a, a lawsuit that's only recently been filed, and there are essentially three buckets of money that are available for public schools in North Carolina. You have the state per pupil appropriation, you have local per pupil appropriations, and you have a capital outlay, the construction money. And when charter schools were created by the General Assembly, uh, the, the legislation for charter schools did not include the capital outlay opportunity. Uh, now you have to remember charter schools are in fact public schools and all of the students in, pub in the charter schools are public school students, but they're uh, deprived of an opportunity to even go to the county commissioners and say, well, we, we need uh, some school construction money to, to assist with us. So that lawsuit has been filed challenging the constitutionality of, of that legislation based upon the uniformity provision that was referenced uh, earlier. Now, the Atkin, Atkinson case uh, in which uh, uh, the Institute for Constitutional Law represented Dr. June Atkinson uh, is, is sort of a fascinating uh, story of, of constitutional development, I, and I can't really go into all of it, but, but the bottom line was back after Governor Purdue came in uh, into office, she uh, appointed Dr. Bill Harrison, superintendent of Cumberland County Schools, to uh, uh, the post of a member of the State Board of Education. Board of Education elected him chairman and then created uh, a separate position of CEO of Education and hired Dr. Uh, Harrison for that position. And essentially, 
strip Dr. Atkinson, who is the duly elected superintendent of public instruction, of all practical responsibilities for running uh, the state school system. Uh, Dr. Atkinson uh, filed suit and, and the trial court ruled that the governor's acts were unconstitutional. Uh, the superintendent of public, ins uh, of public instruction is a constitutional officer. Article 3 of the state constitution provides, along with the attorney general, the treasurer, and other uh, council of state positions, that this is a, a position that you, the voters, elect every four years. And with that designation, uh, there are certain constitutional rights and responsibilities that go with the job. And there, there's a specific uh, duty for the superintendent. It's, she's the chief administrative officer of the State Board of Education. And, and so the lawsuit sort of dealt with how do you interpret that? Uh, there was a change of language when the 1971 Constitution was adopted. Uh, what did it mean? Was the superintendent merely an employee of the board? or did the superintendent have real constitutional authority? Fortunately, the Superior Court uh, ruled in Dr. Atkinson's favor, uh, and the state chose not to appeal. So uh, the case is now concluded, and Dr. Atkinson is vested with all of the uh, authority uh, of the duly elected constitutional officer that she is. Professor Dining, let's, let's move on to another controversial issue, and, and I know our audience will be familiar with this, the lottery, or as some may call the education lottery, uh, was somewhat controversial when it was enacted, and um, it was, uh, uh, as I say, somewhat con uh, controversial, but some thought it was constitutional and some thought it wasn't. Uh, wh what about that? Sure. Well, the education lottery has raised at least two recent questions first question, probably the fundamental question, was it created in a constitutional fashion? Now, the North Carolina Constitution says in another article of the Constitution, other than the education article, it says anytime the legislature wants to raise a tax or pledge full faith and credit of the state, essentially revenue bills must are so special that they must be read by the legislature and voted on by the legislature on three separate days. They don't want the legislature surprising the people by just passing it one time and then dealing with it. Well, the education lottery was not read and voted on on three separate days. So the question that came before the North Carolina courts, well, is the North Carolina education lottery a tax or revenue bill of the kind that needs to be read and voted on three separate days? The North Carolina appeals court said it's not a tax or revenue bill and therefore it was created legitimately went up to the North Carolina Supreme Court. The court split three to three and therefore upheld the appeals court ruling, so the education lottery continues. But a second issue has been raised more recently, and this is more of a political issue, and that is the education lottery, hence its name, was billed to the public as money, these proceeds, would be spent on education. Earlier this year, some of that money was spent on matters other than education. Now, there's nothing illegal about that per se, but it could be said to violate the original campaign promises that supporters made. So some folks have turned to proposing a constitutional amendment, a change to North Carolina Constitution, that would say, just as Virginia did about a decade ago, all money and proceeds raised to the North Carolina Education Lottery must be spent on education and no other ways. That's a proposed constitutional change. It's certainly not been adopted, but it could be adopted to remedy that problem. Justice Orr, you wanted to have Well, th there's, a, on there's that. a very interesting uh, and very new twist to the point that uh, John raised about the governor's, quote, raid on the lottery uh, fund that was to go to capital construction. When she took the money out of it, moved it over to the general fund to be used for other purposes. Uh, the Court of Appeals just rendered a decision in the case called Goldston uh, versus State, which dealt with Governor Easley's raid on the Highway Trust Fund. Bill knows a lot about that for sure. Uh, and the, the court, in a two to one decision, said that the governor did not have the constitutional authority to take this money, which had been specifically appropriated by the General Assembly for highway purposes, and move it to the, to the general fund. 
uh, and, it, and it deals with the governor's constitutional authority uh, under the balanced budget requirements of, of the Constitution. But the implication potentially is that if the governor can't do it for the Highway Trust Fund, she can't do it for the Lottery Construction Fund. She can't do it for the Clean Water Trust Fund. And that case is going to the Supreme Court, so we'll get a hopefully something other than a 3-3 vote uh, on it. But I think it, it has some very interesting uh, implications and, and ramifications. Uh, Terry Stoops, um, we talked about judges and talked about funding. Uh, is there any particular trends that you could make observation about that causes North Carolina to be particularly unique uh, versus our, our constitutional requirements for education? Well, I'm finding in general that there are what I call the three M's that are pushing a lot of these lawsuits that are claiming constitutional violations uh, regarding public education. Media, measurement, and metropolis. And now, media and metropolis are pretty straightforward. Uh, the media is providing images of students suffering. We can actually see what is happening in classrooms, and so it's very easy for us to visualize uh, a violation of a student not getting an adequate education. Metropolis uh, is certainly uh, uh, reminiscent of uh, what's happening in our urban areas, the cities, uh, and students that are being ill-served in the cities. But what I want to focus on is measurement, because this isn't really uh, taken into account much. We're in an era of an accountability, testing. And because we are, we now have a measure of how one student compares to another. Some would call it an objective measure, although our tests really uh, don't st stack up very well in that regard. But we have some sort of measure, some number that we can attach to student performance. And now that all students in the state are taking these tests, and this is happening in every state, we can now judge how one student in one school district is comparing to a student in another school system. And now we can determine, after that, that one student is being ill-served compared to another student who's being much better served based on the kind of standardized tests that we have. Now, um, we have uh, had tests in North Carolina since around 1996, and those have not been very reliable tests. In fact, uh, when they first came out around 1996, probably for three or four years afterwards, it was later revealed that those tests uh, set the bar very low. So that's not a very good standard by which we can judge whether one student is being uh, treated better than another. Uh, fortunately, when the Leandro ruling was brought down, they they said, okay, we're going to look at tests, but we're not going to treat them as absolutely authoritative. And that is really the right approach. They're guides, they're hints about how one student compares to another, but they're not really uh, as authoritative as we would like them to be. One second issue, and this is, uh, this is important more toward teacher quality, is that um, we really don't know what makes a teacher good. Uh, despite advances in statistics and unbelievable computing power, we can't really tell exactly why teacher X is better than teacher Y. It would be great for, if the judiciary had that information because they can go and say, we want these sorts of teachers to be in these districts because these districts are being ill-served. But unfortunately, there is no magic formula like that. So the problem of being able to measure teacher quality or our inability to do so certainly complicates things and makes it very, very difficult when answering these questions about whether students receive an adequate education. Uh, Justice Orr, uh, Terry Soups brings up a good point. Uh, the role of the courts in uh, ed public education in North Carolina and one decision that you know a thing or two about is a 1997 decision, Le Le Leandro decision. Um, what about that decision and how does that impact us today? Well, potentially, Leandro was maybe one of the most significant decisions of the state Supreme Court in its 200-plus uh, year history. Uh, it started when a group of low-wealth counties uh, filed a, a lawsuit on behalf of a group of parents and students, uh, the lead student, uh, lead plaintiff being Rob Leandro. Uh, and their, their complaint was that they came from poor counties where the property tax rate was such that they could not adequately uh, provide the kind of facilities and opportunities for their students that uh, 
uh, wealthier counties, the, the Wake counties, the Orange counties, arguably the Rowan counties uh, uh, of the world could provide to their students. And since the, the primary funding responsibility for facilities was at the county level, uh, they, they brought a lawsuit challenging it. A group of large metropolitan counties intervened saying, wait a minute, we got our own problems. Uh, if, if the low wealth counties are going to get taken care of, you know, we, we want to be at the table. And so it, it comes to the Supreme Court uh, and the, the argument was an equal funding argument. And uh, the court, or at least six of the seven justices, rejected the equal funding. Uh, I frankly thought the Constitution uh, provided for that. But uh, then Chief Justice Mitchell was determined that the court was not heading down a funding path, an equal funding path, and instead turned to a more, uh, shall we say, esoteric concept. And that is that the Constitution, and if you look at Article 15, uh, or Section 15 of Article 1, the Declaration of Rights that we, uh, Terry and, and John talked about at the beginning, the people have a right to the privilege of education and it is the duty of the state to guard and maintain that right. And the court held in Leandro that there is a constitutional right to the opportunity for a sound basic education and the state has the constitutional duty to make sure as best it can, that all of our students get this opportunity. And the case was then sent back to the trial court. Uh, judge Manning was appointed the uh, special uh, superior court judge for the case. Went to Hope County, spent oh, probably a year and a half, two years in Hope County taking evidence, a lot of the test information Terry was talking about, uh, compiling thousands of pages of evidence wrote a 350-page order in which he concluded that uh, the state was violating the rights of the students, particularly at-risk students in Hope County, uh, and that the state uh, had to start taking the necessary steps to remedy that. And Bill, I don't know whether you want me to st stop right now. I mean, there's, there, it, it ultimately comes back to the Supreme Court I wrote the opinion in Hope County, which is the second installment of, of Leandro. Uh, well, but, uh, Bob, I was going to say, uh, that, that segues into what we were going to talk about next. Um, and, uh, and Terry Stoops, uh, there was another case, um, not to get too legal about the whole issue, but uh, 1987, there was the Britt case. Now, can we compare Britt, uh, where the state Supreme Court didn't find any constitutional violation, uh, versus the more recent opinion, albeit um, uh, back in 1997, to Leandro. What can we say about those two cases? I, I think it's a very good comparison to see two different lines of, of thought. In the, in the Brit case, uh, there was no constitutional violation that was found. Uh, instead, what the judges found was that students had a right to equal access, with emphasis on the access, uh, to a fundamental right to provide a general and uniform education. And what they said was, well, since there is no constitutional violation, it's up to the legislature, the General Assembly, to go back and to fix the funding system. If there's a problem with the funding system, it's up to the General Assembly and has nothing to do with the judiciary. Leandro was a corrective to that and said, no, the Constitution does provide for a sound basic education. And let me just outline what the Leandro uh, decision said that that sound basic education consisted of the ability to read, write, and speak English, the English language and sufficient knowledge of fundamental mathematics and physical science, fundamental knowledge of geography, history, basic economic and political systems, sufficient academic and vocational skills. This, to the Leandro Court, was what a sound basic education consisted of. Now, it's very interesting to see what happened after the Leandro decision. As, as Judge Orr said, it, it went to Judge Manning, and uh, Judge Manning has been uh, very forward with a lot of the school systems that are failing. He will not accept failure, and I think that's a very good thing. But what the, uh, stu the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, the uh, State Board of Education did, was to establish the Disadvantaged Student Supplemental Fund. And this was meant to address some of these low-wealth uh, areas and to give them money. Now, 
Unfortunately, there was a study done a couple years ago that looked at all the states that had funding uh, for these equity and adequacy lawsuits, and it found North Carolina ranked 27th with only $16 per student uh, giving to, because of this uh, judicial order. Uh, New Jersey was on top with over $6,648 per student uh, given because of their judicial order. So the effect of Leandro was another $16 per student according to this study. In other states, there have been many thousands of dollars given to students in low income, low wealth areas. Um, and in fact, uh, North Car Carolina in the end uh, had the smallest amount of money for these low income students as a result of, of Leandro. Professor Dynan, um, uh, we've, we've talked about the court's involvement and, and we've talked about school finance. And So how does North Carolina compare with the role that the judges have played and this back and forth with school finance, lottery and, and the like? How does North Carolina compare with other states in the union? In regard to these school finance cases that we've just been talking about, North Carolina is like other states in one respect. It's also unlike other states in a second respect. First of all, North Carolina is like other states in that from the 1970s through the 1990s, a number of other state Supreme Courts also became involved in supervising how much money the legislature should be spending on education, um, where they should be spending it, whether they should be targeting it at risk. North Carolina is one of a number of states that issue decisions such as Leandro and Hoke. In a second respect, though, North Carolina is a bit unlike other states. And that is many of the other states where judges became, began becoming very intricately involved in particular school finance decisions. In most other states, those judges have now gotten out of that business. They have asked themselves, are we better off and are we better than legislators or local school board officials to make these decisions? What gives us a better position to do so? Many state Supreme Courts then that have gotten involved have now decided that they're not the best positioned to make those decisions and they have ceded that back to the legislature. We see this in New Hampshire last year. We see this in a very important New Jersey decision earlier this year. So that comes to a fundamental question of what is the specialty or expertise of judges to make very important school finance decisions. North Carolina courts have taken that plunge and Judge Manning is still involved, as has been mentioned, in a very intricate fashion. At a certain point, the question gets raised, judges versus legislators, who better to make some of these decisions? Justice Orr, you wanted to well, say it, something it, it about really that? Well, it really is an, an important and, I think, interesting point that, that we can elaborate on here. And that's the fine line when you come to talking about separation of powers. The state constitution has a very specific provision about the separation of powers, executive, legislative, and judicial. And yet we know that if there is a, a violation of the constitution, of, of constitutional rights, it's the duty of the court to so find uh, and to impose a remedy. But the question is, how far can the judge go? And I think Judge Manning, for some years now, has been walking a fine line. In, in the Hope County case that, uh, that I referenced, one of the uh, remedies that he mandated was that, that the state provide educational services for at-risk students prior to kindergarten. And while we affirmed most of what Judge Manning did, on that particular point, the Supreme Court reversed Judge Manning and said, no, th that's a decision uh, for the legislature. And they have a right to look at a range of options. You know, that may be the solution, but it may not be the solution. Uh, and it's not the court's role, certainly at that point, to uh, be telling the legislature exactly how to, how to shape uh, that component of, of educational policy. On the other hand, what do you do if the legislature or government simply doesn't do what the court says it's supposed to do? Do you, does, does the judge ignore that? Does he send the, the marshal over, or the sheriff over to the General Assembly to uh, arrest the, the speaker uh, or the governor? I mean, uh, you, you can see the, the tension that, uh, that is there. And you, and you might notice that 
probably for the last four or five years, Judge Manning has not actually entered an order, which of course is appealable. Uh, he has tended to articulate his position, but without entering any kind of order saying do this, do that. Although in Halifax County, which uh, he recently found, uh, I think he described it as close to educational genocide based upon what was happening there, uh, he is getting pretty close when he orders the state board and uh, the superintendent uh, into court to tell him what are you going to do to fix this. Terry Stoops, you think this trend will continue? It, it will depend on the success of, of Halifax County. I, I think that uh, it was an extraordinary step for the State Board of Education and the Department of Public Instruction to send literally millions of dollars in resources to a very struggling school system. Uh, if they are successful, I think there is a model there for attending to some of these uh, low-income, low-performing school systems. If the state fails to fix Halifax school system, uh, I think we're going to see a red-faced Judge Manning uh, really give it to the State Board and the Department of Public Instruction and look for an alternative way to try to turn around these school systems. The stakes uh, that are going to be, uh, uh, as a result of the Halifax County intervention, are going to be enormous. And so it's really wait and see at this point. Yeah, one final point on this, uh, Professor Dinan, do you, do you see this wheel and trend continuing uh, and making North Carolina more of a minority type of a state with regard to the, to the way the other states have functioned in, in courts and education? I mean, I should say North Carolina is not alone in the courts continuing to be involved. South Carolina as well, the courts are also involved in a continued debate. So, but it is the case that over the last decade, particularly since 2002, a number, at least 11 state Supreme Courts that had had jurisdiction over school finance cases have terminated jurisdiction, whether because they thought the legislature had successfully met its obligations or in part because judges have said, I'm not sure that we're the best place to continue this discussion. Some of those judges, for instance, have looked at clauses similar to North Carolina's where it says equal opportunity should be provided for all students and said, how exactly can we take that language and determine from that language, as Judge Manning did in an overturned decision, that means in effect that you must have uh, pre-K programs for at-risk students. That's a large leap to take from very general language to a very particular decision that was overturned, of course, as Judge Orr mentioned. But other judges in other states have said, perhaps that's too big of a leap. Perhaps the legislator and the political process is a better position to make decisions about scarce resources and competing resources, education versus roads versus other matters. The State of Our Constitution series was started to uh, foster North Carolina state constitution uh, literacy to become, have the general public become more familiar with uh, the, our state's constitution. And uh, as we've been talking about uh, education in this particular segment, the third in the series, uh, Justice Orr, I'll go back to you. Um, why should North Carolina citizens, the average citizen, be literate in what our state constitution either says or doesn't say about the various topics, particularly in education in this regard? Well, when I left uh, UNC Law School in 1975, I, I'm not even sure I knew we had a state constitution. It just simply uh, had no relevance in the context of uh, the, the educational system uh, in the law schools uh, around the state. Uh, what I discovered, though, after 10 years on the state Supreme Court, that virtually every major case that the state Supreme Court dealt with had a state constitutional component, whether it was education in Leandro, whether it was economic incentives in Moretti, whether it was redistricting in Stevenson. You know, you looked at the big cases and there was the state constitution. And it's important to recognize that the state constitution is a limitation upon power. The federal constitution is a grant of power from the states to the, to the federal government. But your, your state constitution is your real protection against a virtual blank check to the General Assembly or the executive branch when it comes to government. And I, I'll give you one perfect example. Article 5, which deals with finance, 
uh, deals with the power of taxation. And in Article 5, it says that the power of taxation shall only be used for a public purpose. That is the ultimate limitation upon government. Before they can take money from you and your fellow citizens in the form of taxes, it has to be for a public purpose, and it has to be used for a public purpose. Now, the question that our group has litigated and the incentives issue is, is giving Dell $300 million a public purpose, or is that essentially a private purpose with only tangential benefit to the public? But it is your protection. And so as, as good citizens of this state, whether it's in the, the realm of taxation or public education, uh, any of the, the myriad rights uh, set out in the Declaration of Rights, uh, you and all our citizens should be conversant with what the state constitution says. And our schools, I actually spoke at a middle school on Constitution Day in a class that studies North Carolina history, and there was nothing about the North Carolina Constitution in the book. It was all about the U.S. Constitution. You know, so we have a real challenge ahead of us, and uh, I would encourage each and every one of you to pick up one of our uh, little copies and read it, study it, start asking questions. Terry Stoops, uh, should North Carolinians become very familiar with their state's constitution? Absolutely, and, and certainly what I worry about most is our, our youngest North Carolinians, our, our children. Uh, our schools are not doing a very good job teaching uh, kids about the North Carolina Constitution. There is a Constitution component uh, in the civics and economics curriculum, but we recently got a chance to look at the test from the civics and economics course. And there were three substantial questions about the North Carolina Constitution in that test. The first one dealt with an excise tax, which is apropos for this state. The second had to deal with the governor's uh, position as commander in chief. The question asked about who has the right to call on the National Guard. That's the, that's, the, that's, that's the governor. And this should bring a smile to Judge Orr's face. The third question was about Leandro. That's a good question to ask students about Leandro. The other two are pretty irrelevant questions to ask students about. Uh, especially irrelevant in the sense that if you look at what the state requires students to know about uh, the North Carolina Constitution in their civics and economics curriculum, those, tests, those test questions are very minor parts of a larger curriculum and students should be forced, pushed, and demanded to know more about the Constitution under which they and their parents live. Unfortunately, I think we're doing a very bad job teaching about it and perhaps the problem is, is that our teachers don't know enough about it themselves in order to pass it down to their students. That might be in a problem in itself, but we're doing even a worse problem testing and asking questions about that the North Carolina Constitution as well. Professor Don? Well, knowing about the North Carolina Constitution can be important because judges often issue important interpretations of the Constitution, as we've heard. Knowing about the North Carolina Constitution can be important to be a good citizen of North Carolina, as we've also heard. But I want to add an additional reason. Knowing about the North Carolina Constitution can be important because the people can play an important role in changing the North Carolina Constitution. The U.S. Constitution, very difficult to amend, 27 amendments total. The first 10 of those were passed in the Bill of Rights. So only 17 amendments to the U.S. Constitution since the Bill of Rights. But the North Carolina Constitution, like most other state constitutions, is more readily amendable. You get three-fifths of the legislature to propose an amendment, and then you get a majority of the people to ratify the amendment at a referendum. You've changed the North Carolina Constitution. So if you are dissatisfied with some parts of the way the North Carolina education system is run with constitutional implications, you can change the North Carolina Constitution. If you don't like the idea that North Carolina elects its superintendent of public instruction. The solution is not to bypass the superintendent. The solution is to amend the North Carolina Constitution to say, as many states do, we will appoint the superintendent rather than elect them. If you are dissatisfied with the diversion of funds from the education lottery to non-education matters, one solution to, do, to that 
is to do as Virginia did, as I mentioned earlier, change the North Carolina Constitution to say no lottery funds shall be used for any other purpose other than education funds. I've given two education-related examples, but I could go on and give other examples as well. If you don't believe that private property is protected sufficiently through existing provisions, in particular the invocation of eminent domain for various purposes, one could tighten those provisions in the North Carolina Constitution. I could give other examples, but the bottom line is knowing about the North Carolina Constitution is important because if you're dissatisfied with it, you have a ready way to change it. And that's important to know that. I think it's fair to say from the discussion that uh, learning about the North Carolina Constitution will empower the general public to at least understand what rights or remedies, more focus on the remedies that folks would have. Uh, to Professor Dinan's point, whether it's transportation, education, clean water, or what have you, uh, that knowing the provisions in the Constitution gives them another tool that they have when, whenever they're voting or advocating for legislative change or uh, the next election. Yeah, let me add one thing, because that was a great point that Professor Dinan made about the amendment process. I would have sworn that when the Constitution is amended and you, the voters, are given an opportunity to vote at an election on a constitutional amendment, that the actual constitutional amendment would be on the ballot. It's not and hasn't been for 100 years. A summary prepared by the legislature is what you see. And uh, our group was actually involved in some litigation over Amendment 1, which was passed in 2004, uh, dealing with the fact that there was this long 28-line constitutional amendment uh, which started out notwithstanding uh, the provisions in Article 4, or something to that effect, which in effect took away your right to vote for certain types of bonds. And you know, the public was never informed that this constitutional amendment was about taking away your right to vote on TIF bonds. And yet that's exactly what it was about and that it passed by a narrow margin. But if we can have truth in advertising, I certainly hope uh, along the lines that you know John and Terry have said, we ought to have truth in amending the Constitution. You know the the voters, and that's again the importance of understanding the Constitution. Uh, so I would encourage you the next time there's an amendment on the ballot, you know take some time in advance to make sure uh, you really understand what's at issue. Now. Uh, that's a wonderful segue into our audience questions and this is going into the segment where we're going to take questions on three by five cards from the audience and uh, we'll throw that out to the panel for discussion and uh, Justice Orr you happen to mention bonds and our hap first question happened to be something about bonds so uh, North Carolina Constitution article 1 section 8 has to do with representation and taxation you can go to your little book there and look that up uh, so the question is, why is it that North Carolina counties and municipalities have moved away from traditional borrowing standards of uh, general obligation uh, bonds and requiring voter approval uh, to the more favorable use of uh, certificates of participation and uh, no vote required, especially for school financing? So it's the general obligation bonds uh, uh, moving toward the uh, certificates of participation and uh, kind of leaving the voter out of uh, that discussion a little bit. Um, Judge it, Lord, is a, start with that? It, it is a very troubling trend, and it started back in the mid-'80s with a North Carolina State Supreme Court decision that said as long as the government does not pledge its full faith and credit to the bonds, but instead secures the debt with a schoolhouse or the courthouse or the social services building, that you, you are not required to take it to the people for a vote, that you're only required to take it to the people for a vote uh, if you pledge the full faith and credit. And we have seen a dramatic increase at both state and local uh, government levels of elected officials simply saying, why risk having the bonds voted down? Let's just do a certificate of participation We'll secure it with some other type of, of uh, collateral. Uh, it costs more, 
to the to the public, but uh, it it stems from uh, you know a political desire to spend without going to the voters for approval, and from a uh, Supreme Court case in the 1980s that I thought was wrongly decided, but is precedent as we sit here. Uh, these certificates of uh, participation are typically referred to in the press as COPS. Right. And um, th these uh, types of funding uh, tools, uh, Professor Dinan, uh, is this radically different than other states are using around the country and to, to your knowledge? No, I think Judge Orris has, has identified a trend and that is uh, voters are given a lot of opportunities for participation in most states and they are given an opportunity to play a key role in approving bonds and approving going into debt. Of course, some states, about half the states, actually have the initiative and referendum process where you can actually, unlike North Carolina, actually put matters on the ballot and approve them without any participation in the legislature. That's, of course, not present in North Carolina. That's maximum popular participation. And still, the North Carolina Constitution, like other constitutions around the country, really does provide an important role for the public. And yet, that important role for the public also gives the public a potential veto power over some decisions that other officials would want to make. And so there is a natural tendency to try to avoid the uh, participation of the p people and their potential veto. And that could be seen as troubling by some. Terry Stoops, I wanted to go to you and then we'll go to our next question. Uh, th these COPs and other uh, general obligation funding mechanisms, does the Constitution say anything about what right the citizen has or hasn't uh, uh, possesses? Uh, whether or not they can challenge these these certificates of per, uh, participation? It's not clear that it does and, and from an educational standpoint it, this is used in, in school construction uh, way too often uh, is that a municipality or, or county will take out a cop to, to build a school building uh, and, and this will uh, this will uh, uh, force taxpayers to put forth another one or two percent uh, interest rate uh, on that debt over 20 or 30 years, depending on how long uh, those bonds are sold for. So, uh, you know, just from a from an educational standpoint, uh, from a fiscal standpoint, and from from an education finance standpoint, uh, cops are extremely bad way to go. If you take to the voters a school construction plan uh, that is reasonable. Uh, that meets all the needs of the school system, that doesn't require large tax increases, the voters are going to vote for it. And I think that's what a lot of these local uh, school systems and, and uh, county commissioners often forget, is that if you have a good plan, present that plan to the voters and they will vote for it. But they don't even want to do that. Instead, they go forth with a certificate of participation and say, we're not going to worry about the voters. Our plan probably isn't that good, but we don't have to worry about presenting it to uh, the, our constituents, and we'll just uh, deal with the 1% to 2% additional interest rate. Uh, I'll be long out of office by the time they have to pay that back. Possibly their grandchildren might have something to say about that issue. We have another question, uh, and this question has to do with IDEA, the acronym. Um, Will IDEA bankrupt counties since this unfunded mandate must be complied with? Well, that deals, uh, IDEA deals mostly with, with the federal government and the federal government's in, in involvement in, um, in education. The federal government uh, basically provides money for two different purposes for public education. Uh, disabled kids and uh, or special education, special needs children, and low-income children. So uh, whether it's an unfunded mandate or not, uh, the federal government always gives unfunded mandates uh, with, with, uh, with an emphasis on the uh, uh, mandate part. Uh, that's just what they do, and this is just another reason why we need, of course, less federal involvement because the more they get involved, the more that they will mandate um, that certain services uh, be provided and that, uh, that, that students with uh, certain needs fall under IDEA. That means they fall under federal legislation and, and, and federal law. Uh, that's a problem in itself, but uh, I, I think this is just uh, an, another way to, uh, to broaden the federal government's control over our public schools. Justice Orr, any comment on that? Or? No, I think Terry's uh, 
nailed it, and it, it presents you know that that ongoing debate that we literally opened the discussion with about uh, local control versus state or federal, and and uh, I, I think most people agree that that you know the more the more local control and direction to the education of our children, uh, be they special needs children or uh, other, uh, other students in the system, uh, we're, we're better off than having mandates from Washington. Uh, let's, um, uh, let's elaborate a little bit um, on local school boards and its um, authority to sue county commissions for additional funds. Uh, um, mm. Justice Ori, I mean, <laughs> you seem uh, to be... That's a hot topic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you want to start us off? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm now wandering into areas that I don't know quite as much about as <laughs> some of the other things we've discussed. Uh, you know, the, the, the controversy, as I understand it, is that uh, the school board sets the needs. We need these schools, these resources, but the county commissioners appropriate the money and impose the tax. And so the question is, well, does that make any sense? Uh, you know, shouldn't the, the school, the elected school board, uh, if, if they feel that the tax, uh, tax rate needs to go up in order to uh, uh, provide greater resources to the schools, shouldn't they be the ones to do it? Uh, as opposed to the county commissioners. Uh, I, I don't know that there's a constitutional issue there. I think it's simply uh, probably a legislative determination as to, as to how, how you get money for schools and who, who is the, the elected body that, that has to make that decision. But I'll punt that to John. How about well, that? No. Yeah, I mean, it essentially was in a case recently decided by the North Carolina court, it raised the question how to interpret a statute that would or would not permit such a suit to take place. And the determination was made that in reading the statute, it did not prohibit such a suit. Now, there's still some matters that was remanded for further determination. But as of now, the current understanding is that such suits could be permissible and essentially for the purpose of trying to get more funding that the, that the board believes is, is, is in order. Very important and very current question. And I, ju I just want to add real quickly, I mean, the holy grail for a lot of school systems uh, and school boards and the school boards association is, is taxing authority. And they would love the Constitution to give them taxing authority so that they can set the tax rate for the own, their own money that's coming in. I think it's a terrible idea because the county commissioners act as a check and balance system. Uh, so, you know, but, but this is the holy grail, and this is what the School Boards Association uh, would like to see uh, every school board in the state set their own tax rate and, and collect that money and use it for their own, usually nefarious purposes. <laughs> We've had another question about, uh, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but uh, uh, the free higher education provision that's referenced in the state constitution, how does that square with? Uh, um, and and I'll, I'll again start with Bob because of his uh, wonderful uh, institution of, of uh, he, that he's alum of, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, Bob, how does it square that you have a North Carolina student um, that has, uh, quote, the constitutional opportunity to engage in higher education? And um, there's a wonderful football prospect out there from from I hope well, he's an a state that lineman. That's yeah, <laughs> a state that will remain nameless. Uh, how does that square? <laughs> does that kick the North Carolina student out? And does the, the the state constitution provide that authority? And and to throw the other wrinkle in, does the state constitution abrogate uh, or say anything about whether or not that same type of institution over in Raleigh could hire uh, and set an unfettered or any policy or pay in the term uh, uh, they wish to in the hiring. Uh, does the North Carolina higher education system have that unfettered uh, authority under state constitution? Well, well I'm not sure that, that the constitution provides a limitation on those various scenarios. I mean, it just simply authorizes that the General Assembly shall maintain a public system of higher education and then uh, deals with uh, uh, 
various other provisions. The benefits uh, uh, shall be, as far as practical, be extended to the people of the state free of expense. Uh, every year I expect some lawsuit to be filed whenever the university uh, or universities raise uh, tuition and fees. Uh, I expect some student to come and say, well, I'm going to file a suit because uh, it says here in the Constitution it should be as uh, free uh, to the, as far as practicable. Uh, but I, I think there's some interesting issues there. I mean, the, the, the tuition break for athletic scholarships that uh, are treated as in-state students and thus subsidized by the taxpayers. Uh, is an interesting one. I think Dr. William Friday would love to see a lawsuit uh, challenging uh, that issue. Uh, he's spoken to me a couple of times about his concern. Um, I, I won't get into the NC State hiring uh, <laughs> issue. I'll let Terry deal with that one. So. Well, I, I, I think uh, Professor Donnan wanted to weigh in on well, one of those. I just, I, I think that, that that helps really to illustrate an important point. As much as we've been discussing up here, the importance of learning about the state constitution and the various ways that state constitutions play a role, it is in the end a limited role in the overall system. That is, not every issue will be a state constitutional issue. Some issues will involve legal questions, such as North Carolina state law but won't be ones of North Carolina state constitution. And still other issues will be essentially political questions. Is it a good idea to do this? Is it wise to do this? And won't even then involve questions of legal or even state constitutional matters. So it's important. We're, we've, we've been trumpeting the, the importance of the state constitutions at the same time we keep in mind the overall context. It is still one piece of an overall legal puzzle. Terry, how about that hiring issue? I think higher education would be close to free if uh, they didn't make hires like uh, Mary Easley and all the administrators that they recently fired. I mean, I, I, it's, it's certainly something that's, uh, that, that's disappointing to, to see that uh, we, have a, we have a higher education system that is that bloated, um, that will politicize uh, its administration in that way. Um, to the detriment of students, I, you know, I, I actually wouldn't mind seeing a lawsuit like that. Uh, um, as Judge Orr recommends, but um, <laughs> but since I'm not a lawyer, I can say things like that, so I can I can get away with it. Uh, but but certainly, it's a disturbing trend to see the size of the administration at the UNC system explode as it has uh, to the detriment of students. And really, uh, you know, it, it feels like uh, to uh, to a violation of the Constitution, or at least the spirit of the Constitution. We, we seem to have come a little bit on the, on the circle side because uh, we, we started talking about courts and, and we're still talking about courts and we let's, let's go back to let's go back to some money issues. Uh, one of the questions from the audience says, well, why do we have a lottery? Why don't we just have an education tax? What about that? Dr. Professor Dinan? Well, in some states, uh, I know Pennsylvania has a school tax, particularly. I'm familiar with Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, what about North Carolina? Why don't we just get rid of the lottery and have a school tax? I mean, there are, I should say, there are some states which actually have in their constitution requirements that a certain percentage of the state budget, for instance, must be spent on education. So, so we, we do have some, some provisions of that kind, and we have other provisions where there are certain taxes which are allotted for particular reasons. One of the challenges that you, you get in there is how much do you want to hamstring or constrain the legislature, and how much do you want to give the legislators the chance to make their own decisions about funding. And to put too much of this in the Constitution does run the risk of leaving the legislatures without the discretion to say, oh, this is a, a, a really tough year. We're going to have to make some cuts someplace. They are free, if it's not constitutionally constrained, to make those decisions as they see fit. So that's one of the downsides of actually constitutionally putting that, uh, making those such provisions. Justice Orr? Well, I think that's a good point. Uh, some states have amended their constitution so much that there, it, it's really nothing more than a, a superset of general statutes. And so uh, conceptually, I think we want the constitution to be more general than specific. Uh, and you know, but one of the and, and one of the challenges, though, it takes a three fifth three fifths vote of the general assembly to present an amendment. To the public. So if the powers that be in the General Assembly 
uh, don't want you to vote on an amendment, whatever it might be, uh, there is that potential. And, and historically, for example, the, the uh, gubernatorial veto was held up for years. You know, it'd, it'd be proposed in the, in the legislature, but uh, the leadership simply would not, uh, uh, would make sure that the three-fifths vote couldn't be mustered and therefore it would never get presented uh, to the voters. We have another question from the audience having to do with uh, special needs students. And certainly, when we talked about earlier terminology that was used uh, in our prior constitutions, 1868, the, we went forward to 1971, and, and, and a lot of the things that we recognize today, autism and Willie M. program and a lot of these others, um, um, state constitutions say anything about that? I mean, it, we, we think we've established, for, as far as terminology goes, that everyone has that, that right or that opportunity. Um, uh, Terry? Uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, the, the state constitution does uh, specify that uh, every child that's able to be educated must be educated uh, regardless of their mental or physical ability. So, uh, well, it says that appropriate age and sufficient mental and physical ability. But essentially that means that, that regardless, all, all children need to be educated. Now, uh, the state does provide uh, quite a bit of funding for special needs students in addition to what the, the federal government provides. Um, it would be interesting, to be completely honest, to see, a, a, not interesting, I mean, I don't welcome lawsuits, I don't want to seem like I'm a lawsuit monger, but uh, a lawsuit on the basis that a special needs student is being uh, ill-served in their local school system and is suing because they're not uh, receiving a sufficient or sound basic education. Now, uh, one of the things that the law provides is that a school system may contract with a private provider for special needs services. And so, uh, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing a parent ch challenge a school system based on that law saying that if you can't provide a sound basic education to my special needs student, then this pri private provider can. Of course, I would also like to see tax credits and vouchers, so, uh, you know, that would certainly be a way to do it, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it to it's Judge War. Well, I think it's very interesting. Leandro, which was decided in 97, uh, has really not been used to the extent that I think many of us anticipated it would be used in, in a whole range of educational issues, uh, such as Terry mentioned, involving uh, special needs uh, students. Uh, there is one case pending at the Court of Appeals uh, with a Leandro theory that deals with whether the state has some kind of requirement for children who are suspended from school for misbehavior, whether you simply send them home and to the street, or whether the state under Leandro has some kind of opportunity or requirement to provide them an alternative educational opportunity uh, as opposed to sending them home. But, but it's, it really has been fascinating uh, to sit around telling audiences, well, Leandro's the most important case that, uh, you know, maybe in our lifetime, and yet very little litigation involving Leandro, uh, the, the, the theory of Leandro uh, has been making its way through the courts. I mean, one of the wonderful things about the U.S. federal system is that you can try to secure your rights at the federal level on the basis of federal guarantees, or failing that, you can try to secure your rights at the state level based on state guarantees. And particularly in regard to individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, there's been a very strong federal statute on that, and there have been some very strong federal Supreme Court interpretations of that statute. So it's perhaps not surprising that that's where you've seen the bulk of activity, not the entirety of the activity taking place, is through federal types of decisions. In contrast with the school finance decision, where in 1973 the U.S. Supreme Court put a halt to these types of rulings by saying there is no U.S. constitutional right to an education. If you will seek judicial redress for your complaints about school funding, that will come from the state level. So it's perhaps to be expected that on certain issues, people pursue their claims through federal court on the basis of federal claims, and on others, you see state courts being the main actors. Well, that was another question that one of the members of the audience had here, and uh, there's been more federal intrusion as time has gone on, particularly with the 
uh, beginning of the Department of Education and other rulings uh, in the 60s and 70s and on into the 80s. Uh, does our North Carolina state constitution provide any break or stop or uh, uh, another path for redress? Professor Diamond? Well, it, it, it provides a path of, uh, usually it's, it, it serves as an alternative form of seeking redress for remedies in that sense. And so you either pursue through the federal court if that's favorable or you pursue through the state court. It's not clear that the, the state constitution itself would serve as a break against federal expansion of power. If one would seek for a break in that sense, one would seek, uh, look to the U.S. Constitution and raise questions about if Congress is trying to do something, is that within the enumerated powers in Article I of the U.S. Constitution? For instance, a question that could be raised about the health care debate underway. One question is, is it a good thing to have the federal government take involvement? A second question, though, is does the U.S. Constitution authorize the federal government to take certain steps? The same types of questions could be raised in regard to education or other matters. And so that's where one would look to undertake litigation or put a possible break on federal expansion of power. Bob? Well, two points. Uh, one is the rights articulated in the state constitution don't necessarily match up uh, across the board with rights articulated in the U.S. Constitution. So you might find in the state constitution a different right. And what's an, an interesting uh, interpretation that, that our courts have articulated uh, involving uh, state constitutional rights is that a state constitution can grant you greater rights than the federal constitution. It can't grant you less. You know, there's, there's a, a floor there that the U.S. Constitution guarantees. And it's only been used, uh, to my knowledge, one time uh, in, in the state courts where uh, the, the, the state Supreme Court has said, well, the federal constitution guarantees this, we're going to guarantee you this plus one. And, and, but yet, that possibility is out there, uh, which is part of sort of the creative litigation of constitutional law, for better or worse. Uh, Terry Stoops, let me go to you, uh, because you'd mentioned uh, vouchers and, and the like. Um, question from the audience is, uh, how pragmatic or pro uh, probable or practical is it for central planning by judicial ruling, in effect, with Judge Manning, to level the playing field between school systems and, uh, and the alternative, would a free market approach be better than having Judge Manning with his thumb on Halifax County? Let me think. Would the John Locke Foundation say that a free market approach is better? <laughs> I'm going to go with the free market approach. I thought you might. <laughs> No, but how does how did really? Um, um, uh, all kidding aside, how does a free market approach or private approach square with the state's constitution? Well, is there a conflict there? I, I, there could be. You know, in an ideal system, the, the state would just be the means by which the, the funds are collected, and then those funds are then taken by the parent to the school of their choice. So there's still a rule for the state. The state is still involved in education. Um, it still can be seen as fulfilling its educational function, but then the parents would also be fulfilling their educational function too, uh, uh, as, as far as the education of their children, sending their dollars, uh, ultimately tax dollars, to where they feel best meets the needs of their child. So uh, a free market in education doesn't necessarily mean that there's no government involvement. Uh, it just means that ultimately uh, the amount of government involvement is minimal and that the maximum amount of uh, choice is given to the parents. Uh, and you could certainly use, I mean, the tax dollars, it would still be considered a system, but, uh, you know, I, I think there will probably be some difficulties with the Constitution, but I say uh, let's try it anyway and see what happens. I uh, Professor Donnan, uh, what about that private market approach? Uh, and, and have other states tried that and, and has it been constitutionally challenged? Sure. How would it square with the federal constitution? You know, and that raises some important questions, the constitutional implications of some of the school choice or school voucher programs in particular. And I should just say on one matter we can be certain, the U.S. Supreme Court said earlier this decade that voucher programs, at least ones as they were uh, implemented in Ohio in particular, did not violate the federal constitution and therefore there was not a federal constitutional bar 
to the, the plans that were out there, at least as I say, in Ohio. Now, as Judge Orr mentioned, state constitutions can have their own distinctive provisions sometimes, and some voucher programs, particularly in Florida, and to some extent in other states, such as Arizona, have run into state constitutional difficulties because state courts have said, well, we have particular provisions here that require a uniform school system, as the Florida Supreme Court said, and this particular voucher program violates that uniformity provision. Or, as other cases have been made, several uh, state constitutions in other states have very particular religious establishment clauses that forbid specifically the spending of public funds on religious schools. And so some state courts have said, although the U.S. Supreme Court finds no constitutional bar on the federal level, we find a state constitutional bar. So it's not without its constitutional pitfalls that they can be overcome, but voucher pro programs first have to overcome some of the legal challenges that they've encountered in other states. And, and I think that uh, under Leandro and Hogue County, the state has the ultimate constitutional responsibility to provide education to the citizens of our state. and. I think what you find is a reluctance to contract it out or, uh, I mean, you can see the, the resistance to charter schools, which are still public schools. Uh, you know, they, they want to have the control uh, and if there's going to be a problem uh, and they're going to be held responsible, then uh, I think they want to be able to do more than just contract it out via, via the money. Although uh, it, it's, a, it's an area ripe for lots of interesting constitutional discussion. Terry Stoops, uh, very quickly. Yeah, let me just mention if you're interested in this, the John Locke Foundation has a report uh, about the constitutionality of school choice in North Carolina. Uh, if you go to our website, you can, you can see that report. It was uh, written in, uh, by the Institute of Justice in Washington. Uh, and uh, published for the North Carolina Education Alliance. So we, we address that in a, in a larger report uh, that's available on our website. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion, and uh, that's all the time we have tonight. I want to thank our panel, Justice Bob Orr, Terry Stoops, and Professor John Dine. It's been a, a wonderful discussion on the North Carolina Constitution and Education. And I want to thank all the members of the audience for the questions that they submitted. I particularly want to thank the John Locke Foundation and uh, a special thanks to all the sponsors we mentioned at the top of the program. And that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you again for attending our third uh, symposium on the state of our Constitution, particularly education. And the North Carolina Constitution and Education Symposium can be viewed at CJTV, cjtv.carolinajournal.com. Thank you and good night, everyone.